Today on Applied Science, I want to show you one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time. With this apparatus, it can accelerate electrons and shoot them out through a special aperture into air, and we can see the beam there. And then also we can put things in front of it, like a phosphor screen, this one came out of an oscilloscope, and actually see the effect working, just like a cathode ray tube, but it's in air. So in today's video I'm going to show you what this special aperture is that allows this to happen, how I built the thing, and industrial uses for electron beams in air. You might be surprised, but in your house there's probably multiple items that were manufactured by being irradiated with electrons. Let's talk about how this thing is built. We're going to create the electrons in the conventional way in a vacuum area, so we need a pretty good vacuum setup. So I have a turbomolecular pump here, this cross-fitting vacuum gauge up here, some electrical pass-through back here, and then here's the business end of this thing in this glass tube. Um, I've got this convenient swift seal here, so you can kind of unclamp it and then just pull the glass tube out, and there's an o-ring that seals inside there. And then as you can see, my filament that's actually going to be boiling off the electrons is just a tiny little light bulb that I've crushed the glass envelope, and I soldered its uh, base to a piece of brass, and so that when the brass is inserted into the tube like this, it fits pretty tightly and centers the filament in the tube. So we'll just hang him here. And then the glass tube I cut on the lathe with the diamond wheel, just so I'd get a very smooth, consistent edge. And the other end is made from a piece of aluminum, which I also cut off on the lathe. And this piece has to be very flat to interface with this special aperture. I used Hysol 1C, which is a special kind of epoxy that's made for high vacuum applications. It's actually really high quality epoxy that you can use for all kinds of things. And it's, I also bought it on Amazon. It's about $15, I think. So let's talk about this special aperture. What is it about this thing that allows electrons to come through? Let me show you. And here it is. Believe it or not, it's an off-the-shelf part that I bought from Ted Pella, and they are specifically made uh, to allow x-rays and electrons through. It's a window, and it's a super, super thin window. It's almost the thinnest window that you can get. And the reason I say that is because these are only 100 nanometers thick, which is like, what, 500 atoms thick. So I've seen these windows available in thinner versions. I think you can get them down to maybe 30 nanometers. But eventually, you just kind of run out of atoms and you can't make it any thinner. So this is really getting down to that level. And as you can imagine, it's very fragile. You can't touch them or anything. Um, but they are strong enough to hold vacuum. So 100 nanometers thick with a 1 by 1 uh, millimeter aperture, which is what these are, are strong enough to hold vacuum forces. In other words, we can have vacuum on one side and one atmosphere of pressure on the other, and they don't break. But they're getting close to it. You probably couldn't have two or three atmospheres of pressure. Um, you'd be surprised. I mean, silicon nitride is like a glassy or a crystal material, and it's weird to think how much these things bow under, under the pressures of atmospheric, you know, air pushing against it. Um, but they do hold together, and um, it does work. Although you can see I only have eight left, so I actually did destroy one of these. Unfortunately, not on camera, but it wasn't that spectacular of a failure anyway. I, um, I, I started the voltage before I was fully pumped down, and there was a plasma formed in the tube. And for some reason, the plasma caused the window to pop, and, you know, obviously I lost vacuum. So I did learn that um, exposing the turbo molecular pump to air, at least through a one by one millimeter aperture, does not kill it. So at least that's a um, existence proof that doing that does not mean instant death for your turbo, although it's probably not good for it in the long term. One other trick if you decide to do this, the, um, the apertures have a flat side and a etched side, and I've heard that the etched side could go towards vacuum and the flat side should go towards your atmospheric pressure. Um, this was about $140 for the 10 apertures, so 14 bucks a piece is actually quite reasonable for something like this. Here's a schematic of how this thing is built. We've got our glass tube here, our aluminum plate here, and the filament from the crushed light bulb here. And uh, in today's setup, I'm gonna put the plate at plus 25 kilovolts and the filament at zero. And there's about a two, volt, um, two volts across the filament to heat it up. And then we've got our aperture here. So the question is, how do we know 100 nanometers is thin enough or thick enough for this aperture? Well, it all comes down to how fast the electrons are going how dense the material is in the aperture and how thick it is. So for an arbitrary thickness, we could just speed the electrons up and force them through. If you have time on the Large Hadron Collider, a lot of things look transparent at those velocities because the particles are just so powerful. They just force their way through anything. 
So the thing that limits us in the home shop is our acceleration voltage. Without a RF powered linear accelerator or something like that, we're gonna be limited to you know the tens of kilovolts range. And in that range, the materials have to be well under a few microns for this to work. Here's a couple um, rules of thumb just to get a sort of an idea of what materials will do to an electron beam. So if we had a one mega electron volt beam, which is relatively high power, um, the, the distance that electrons will travel in air is about 3.5 meters, and in water about 4.2 millimeters, and so on, as you can see for some other materials here. But today we're working at 25 kilo electron volts, and so in air, the distance is about eight millimeters, which, yeah, that actually agrees almost perfectly with the uh, experimental results that I got. And you can see some other uh, results for different materials. So silicon nitride is maybe a little bit more dense than aluminum, so it should go maybe 30 microns in silicon nitride. So in theory, this window could be tens of microns or 10 microns and still work, but there's another consideration. If the window is catching, let's say, half the beam energy that's coming out here, it might absorb so much energy that it destroys itself. So even though uh, our uh, you know, system requirements might be okay, like if we want a beam that's two watts and we have an emitter that's doing four watts, that would meet our challenges from an engineering point of view. But if the window is catching two watts and it's only a micron thick or whatever, it might destroy itself just due to so much energy being absorbed. So the window actually has to be super, super thin just so it allows all of those electrons through and doesn't end up catching so much energy. So you might also be wondering, you know, with all of these electrons flying around in the high vacuum, is this thing producing x-rays? Yeah, you betcha. I mean, it's built exactly like an x-ray tube. The thing is, um, today we're going to be using a supply that maxes out at 300 microamps, so it's significantly less powerful than a medical imaging tube. And also, we don't have any hard metal targets out here. So this is aluminum. Uh, if it were tungsten or something, we'd be producing much harder x-rays here. But yeah, keep in mind, it produces a lot of x-rays. Now, having said that, the intensity of the electron beam coming out here might blow your mind compared to other beta sources. So here's the little beta source that I have. This is strontium-90, and it says on here, it's hard to see, it's actually 0.1 micro curies of, of activity. And by definition, one curie is 3.7 times 10 becquerels, which is decays per second. And I think for a lot of materials, this is essentially how many particles are coming out or the maximum number that could possibly be coming out. But for this analysis, if it's close, it's not gonna matter. So we also know that, we, we know how many electrons are in a coulomb and we know that an amp is one coulomb per second. So let's just say we were only running our tube here at 100 microamps. That ends up being six times 10 to the 14 electrons per second. And so um, it's four orders of magnitude more than one curie of beta decays or beta particles coming out of a radioactive material. But this check source is 0.1 microcuries, so another seven orders of magnitude. So putting it all together, our beta source here is 11 orders of magnitude more plentiful in electrons than what's coming out of this check source here. And even compared to those little tritium vials that you get, uh, those fluorescent tritium vials, even those typically have one curie or less of tritium gas in there. And again, we're, we're four orders of magnitude already at 100 microamps. It's pretty crazy. Um, one other consideration is that the speed of the electrons coming out of this strontium 90 source are in the mega electron volt range, while we're in the 25 kilo electron volt range. So not exactly comparable, but still, it's kind of cool to be able to build something that's actually significantly more powerful than uh, a radioactive source. And it's also at the same time safer in a way because you can just turn the power off and throw all this in the trash and that's totally safe. You don't have to create or transport or dispose of any special uh, radioactive materials in here. And this is actually why industrially they use electron beams to irradiate things. It's, again, because it's safe as soon as you turn it off. It doesn't activate things. It doesn't cause things to become radioactive. It just produces this very controllable source of radiation that has really good known penetration depths. So as we've seen here, even 100 microns of water is enough to completely stop our 25 kilo electron volt electrons. And sure enough, even a post-it note, a thin piece of paper is more than enough to stop the beam in air. So that makes sense. It's good that everything's lining up here. I decided to try a few other things, too, um, that might be interesting. I put a magnet behind the screen, thinking that that would 
deflect the spot a little bit. And I think it's just not enough distance basically to see it. I think there was a, a teeny effect, but it was really hard to see. So that one wasn't too interesting. And then I started looking around the shop for other objects that would be interesting, you know, that would glow in an electron beam. So I tried three different glow powders that I attached to a piece of packing tape, and this worked out really well. They were even phosphorescent, which is pretty cool. And then the next thing I found that's cool is this manganese doped piece of calcite. So this is a naturally occurring material and it has this nice orange phosphorescence that's triggered both by ultraviolet light and by electrons. And so you should definitely check out this video. I'm gonna link in the description to see what happens to a piece of calcite when you shoot it with a mega electron volt beam at high currents. The electrons actually stay in the material and cause it to keep fluorescing for a long time. It's really quite something. And then I thought I had a really good one worked out. I've got some homemade aerogel, and I thought putting that in the beam would be absolutely spectacular because it would be a deep penetration and there might be like, you know, lightning discharges kind of throughout the material. Unfortunately, none of this happened, and all we can see is just the beam of incandescent light coming through the window and shining through there. So that one didn't turn out so good. I also tried some other materials like ruby and silicon carbide and did not get any sort of a uh, electroluminescent effect out of these. And so finally, what I wanted to do is make these Lichtenberg figures. And so you've probably seen these cool paperweights where it looks like there's lightning trapped in plastic. And the way they make these is to send a chunk of plain old acrylic through a particle accelerator, through an electron beam. And the electrons get trapped deep in the, uh, deep in the plastic. And then when they discharge it on purpose with like a sharp metal grounded rod, all of this charge you know, exits the material and you end up with this destructive kind of lightning within the material. And I, I knew that I was kind of on the edge here. As we can see in plastic, you know, we're only getting maybe 90 microns of, of penetration, but I still thought it would work. Unfortunately, it didn't. So I left the acrylic in front of the beam for a little while and then came over when, onto a grounded plate with a grounded screwdriver and tapped it with a hammer. And I couldn't see anything at all. So unfortunately, that one didn't work out. So I mentioned that cancer treatments are actually something that makes use of this limited penetration depth. If there's a tumor just below the skin, it's actually better to use electron radiation, beta rays, as opposed to gamma, because you don't want the energy to go any further. It's actually nice to have this controllable depth. And similarly, they use electron beams to sterilize medical instruments, like you know, face masks, for example. And uh, it's great because you can adjust the power of the beam and like I say, as soon as you turn it off, everything is safe. So it's um, better than handling and storing radioactive material. Uh, but there's a couple other applications that I think you might find surprising. A very large amount of PVC wire insulation is cross-linked with beta radiation, and it makes it more fireproof, apparently. And similarly, heat shrink tubing is made with beta radiation. I think they stretch the plastic and then irradiate it, and that causes it to um, go back to its original shape after you've warmed it up. That whole process, I think, is enabled by beta radiation. And similarly, a lot of things are cross-linked. So you can buy paints that are cured by beta radiation. Um, again, that's great because you don't have to have a volatile organic compound in the paint. You can spray it without any worry of hurting the atmosphere. Uh, you just shine your beta rays on there and the beta rays penetrate through the, the paint's pigments, which ultraviolet light cannot. And so then you can cure opaque paints with this method. Pretty cool. I'll link to a paper that details 10 or 20 other industrial processes. You might be surprised where this thing crops up. So anyway, uh, give me suggestions for what you want me to put in the beam, other than my finger, of course, and uh, we'll put that together and it'll come up in a future video. Okay, hope you found that interesting and I will see you next time. Bye.